Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Staff for Science for the Public and I welcome you to tonight's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight we have the pleasure of talking with Philip Warburg, activist lawyer and author of two very readable books on renewable energy, Harvest the Wind 2012 and Harness the Sun 2015. Philip Warburg graduated from Harvard College in 1978 and joined the staff of then U.S. Senator Charles Percy, where he pioneered legislation to promote renewable energy. Later, after receiving his degree from Harvard Law School, he joined the Washington-based Environmental Law Institute. He was involved for them in a number of important environmental projects in the Middle East and then returned to Boston to become president of the Conservation Conservation Law Foundation, New England's oldest and largest environmental watchdog group. Mr. Warburg was very involved in the proposed Cape Wind project in Massachusetts, Nantucket Sound. This experience and the frustration with wind power's slow progress in New England generally motivated him to write Harvest the Wind in 2012, an account of his travels and discussions with people of all levels of engagement in wind power development. Then in his second book of travels and discussions, Harness the Sun, he investigates the range of solar technologies at the local and more regional levels and he considers the impact of solar energy on diverse communities. Both books provide perspectives of all sorts of people from many areas and the books are very interesting accounts of the prospects of renewable energy. Mr. Warburg has also published articles in major newspapers and magazines. We're delighted to welcome Philip Warburg. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much. Great to be on your show. You started early on as an environmental activist before you even got your law degree. And you mentioned that you uh, were engaged in the Massachusetts uh, uh, effort for wind energy and got quite frustrated. What frustrated you? And then how did that lead to the book, please? Well, I, I'm a proud New Englander, and I've often thought that we really are at the cutting edge of doing the right things environmentally. And heading up the Conservation Law Foundation, I expected that we would be able to move renewable energy forward on a scale that could make a difference uh, here in this enlightened corner of the country. Yeah. And I was very disappointed to find that uh, various powerful actors, including someone I'd long respected as one of the stalwarts of environmental protection, Senator Ted Kennedy, yes. <laughs> um, were vehemently opposed to the Cape Wind project, largely because of their concerns about the visual impact of that wind farm on their open ocean vistas, which struck me as a rather myopic perspective vis-a-vis -vis the overarching challenge of reducing our greenhouse gas okay. emissions and uh, addressing the challenge of climate change. Right, and so you thought, well, I'm gonna write a book. Is that the idea? And you did it in a most unusual way. Could you give us an account there of how you sort of thought this book out? It's well, I, be I began hearing about, when this was in 2008, 2009, and I began to hear about wind farms being built in somewhat improbable corners of the nation, yeah. places like Kansas, South Dakota, Wyoming, where um, the politics would not necessarily have suggested that they would have been at the cutting edge of developing yeah. renewable energy technology, but there they were. And I actually started out in a corner of Kansas with a wonderful name, Cloud County, Kansas, um, where one of the first very large wind farms in Kansas um, was built. Uh, back in 2008, and I spent quite a bit of time there getting to know the farmers, the ranchers, the educators, the local business boosters, just to understand what wind power could bring to that community and 
what motivated them to embrace this technology. Right, and why did they embrace it then? I mean, they apparently didn't have much of a problem. Is that the idea? Well, I think there's a kind of rugged pragmatism that uh, pervades much of the heartland. And just as they were pioneering farmers in the late 1800s, um, they regard wind technology as an important pioneering technology, a pragmatic technology, one that can bolster their farm incomes. When um, you have grain and cattle prices going up and down, you have the wind that blows fairly constantly, and people welcomed the um, annuity of the wind turbines on mm -hmm, their property. Mm -hmm. um, it also was a great jobs provider in a rural county where farm jobs were on the wane. And so it was fascinating to me to see what had happened to the Cloud County Community College, which created a wind technology training program that oh, became how about that? so oversubscribed that the challenge of the director of that program was to keep people in the two year uh, degree program long enough that they could get their degree because the industry was so eager to snap them up and get them out in the field building wind farms. Right. I have to ask, in, in that area, it sounded from the book that people were not so concerned about looking at these things. And you had brought up that this was a problem here in Massachusetts. So what, why, why this difference? You expect people to be more conservative, more resistant in that other corner yeah. of the country. Well, I think if you look at Kansas, there are places that embrace wind and there are places that are vehemently opposed to wind. Uh -huh. In uh, central Kansas and western Kansas where there is a lot of agriculture, I think the turbines are almost seen as a very large farm implement. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the ranchers I, I interviewed said that he views his wind turbines as a kind of very large weather vane because he can see which way the winds are blowing so he knows oh, yeah. when and how to apply his <laughs> pesticides and his fertilizers. Um, so I think there is that kind of pragmatic, um, these are important economic tools, yeah. and just as we have altered the landscape through our farming and our ranching, this is a, a new addition to the landscape, one that will bring revenues, one that will bring economic stability yeah. to our communities. Climate change does not really come up very much in conversation. Uh, this see. isn't about uh, environmental idealism. This is really about energy independence and about um, fiscal responsibility. I see, I see. Now, that was a little while back, and wind, well, solar too, but wind has really evolved rather quickly. Um, what are some of the issues around that with the turbines in large scale or small scale? Has it improved, yes. or what's, what's the situation? Uh, I first just want to mention that in um, Another part of Kansas, the Flint Hills, which is a tall grass prairie country, there are people who are vehemently opposed to uh -huh. wind technology, so I don't want to paint a uniform right. canvas. Right, all of Kansas, Kansas. Is, yeah. is with us Correct. here. Yeah. That said, Kansas today gets about 21 or 22 percent of its total power needs from wind. So we're looking at a state that has really made a fundamental shift away from coal technology and toward wind technology. So that's a very auspicious sign. One of the things that's happened with wind technology over the past several decades, really, mm -hmm. is that what were once very unreliable crude implements developed during a feverish period of developing a new technology in the late 1970s and early 1980s have become very sophisticated, mm -hmm. refined tools much larger in scale. One of the problems in the 70s and 80s, I think, were that um, the proponents of wind technology tended to be fairly small-scale, scrappy entrepreneurs, but the research and development dollars that the federal government was providing uh, were going to really developing um, very large-scale turbines that were not being built during that era at all. So the research was, in the short term, rather irrelevant. And so what was being put in the field um, was not tested in a thorough manner. Uh -huh. A lot of them broke down. Um, at a certain point, we switched from using American technology to using Danish technology because the Danes were much more pragmatic and had developed these rugged uh, wind turbines almost as farm implements rather than as uh, aeronautic Right. That was one of the most interesting points that you said that the um, 
in the United States, the technology was developed by the aeronautical industry. And in Denmark, where they're at like 80% or something now in, in wind energy, but from the get-go, apparently, they had designed more carefully and uh, more craftsman style. That was, did that surprise you? In your well, it impressed me, yeah, I should say. Yeah, right. Um, you knew that there was a big difference. Yes, and to this day, a company called Vestas is the world leader in wind turbine manufacturing. Um, Danish company was active then, active now. Um, so the Danes have really held preeminence. Um, they get about 40% of their total electric power needs uh, from wind today. Um, their goal is by 2050 to be 100% reliant mm -hmm. upon non-carbon fuels. Uh, so they're moving in the right direction. They're really a pioneer uh, in pushing us toward a post-fossil fuel future. Right. They, yeah, that's pretty exemplary. They're over there. It's not that the the weather is not that great, and exactly. so that's so they put us to shame a, a wee <laughs> bit there. But then. You have two things in here, I mean two scales, one's very local, uh, uh, that option, as opposed to these huge wind farms. Can you tell us a bit about that? Do we have options uh, in terms of different regions of the country? Well, I think that um, one of the very interesting distinctions between solar and wind is that while wind technology really does work better at a large scale, um, solar can be applied at everything on down to the household level. One of the reasons why wind works better at a utility scale is that the winds are better at a higher altitude. Yes. And there's a, a rule called the cube rule, which basically says that wind power is the cube of wind speed. So if you're building uh, a taller wind turbine, you're going to get much better wind right. conditions. Yeah, yeah. And another rule says that the swept area, it's called the swept area rule, the area that the wind turbine sweeps, the, the rotor sweeps, um, determines how much power you get from that turbine. So if you increase the length of a blade, as in the radius of a rotor, yeah. by a relatively small amount, you get a disproportionate increase in the productivity of that wind turbine. Uh, you know, the, the A equals um, pi r squared uh, formula applies. So uh, that's that's really great, but it does answer the question, well, why not have it very local? Uh, because it's not that efficient at a local level is your yes. idea. And, and another issue at the local level is that there are issues with noise from wind turbines, yeah. um, not necessarily from the smaller ones, but you do want a um, let's say healthy distance from the nearest industrial scale wind turbine. So siting wind farms becomes a very, very important issue and is often a very contentious issue. Yes, that has been the most contentious er er that we hear yes. through the media and so on. What is the issue there? Is there a real issue? Yeah. Um, I, I think that with any environmental nuisance, it's important not just to look at the average person, but right. to look at the most sensitive populations. And um, there are some people who do find wind turbine noise disturbing. Um, and I think that that needs to be taken into account so that there is a minimum distance between the nearest house, for example, and the nearest um, wind, wind turbine. Um, developers have become smarter about this. Localities have developed siting guidelines. I think that the wind industry really because it developed so quickly, kind of got ahead of the regulatory infrastructure, mm -hmm. and now the regulatory infrastructure is catching up and saying, well, let's, for the, the sake of the industry as well as the sake and of the well-being of individuals, let's create the necessary guidelines so that we won't have angry neighbors. Right. Uh, this seems to be much less of an issue in countries like Denmark, where there's a, a lot of people are for it, but they, uh, there are people that do complain about, say, noise or something yeah. or other, but that's always going to be, uh, I imagine, a case. But in general, yeah. you suggest about regulations, maybe this was better planned in the first place and people were better prepared before things were uh, laid down. In terms of the general expense of of installing large wind farms and and then that payback 
over time yes. to reduce the energy costs and stuff. What's the situation now with wind? Well, a very important metric is the life cycle cost of a wind mm -hmm. turbine because what happens with renewable energy technology, such as solar and wind, is that the upfront costs are considerable, but once you build the technology, mm -hmm. you have zero fuel costs and very low operating costs. So um, if you look at the life cycle costs of wind farms today, they are fully competitive with, for example, a new natural gas-fired mm -hmm, plant. Mm -hmm. um, and if you were to incorporate carbon sequestration into gas combustion technology, then wind farms win hands down. Absolutely, yeah, um, I'm sure. So we're looking at wind, wind farms where, for example, the cost per kilowatt hour over the life cycle of that wind farm can be as low as three, four, five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, right now, gas plants are in the five to eight cent per kilowatt hour range. But so that's, we're yeah, that's uh, down the line. What you're saying is so yeah. obvious there that it's going to pay off. Oh, yes. Right. You mentioned also tornado country, that, that you yes. have to worry about the regions where you install these things. What's the story on that? You, I had never thought about yes. it. I've not heard of a wind turbine being knocked out by a uh, tornado. It may have happened. Um, clearly, that, that is a very real risk to people who live in many parts of the country. And Where wind would be so nice. Correct. Yeah. Um, and if you actually look at the, the wind belt in the country, it extends from the Dakotas on down through Texas, which uh, corresponds to where you end up seeing a lot of uh, tornadoes occurring. So there is that possibility, but um, it's a relatively minor risk, at least according to what has happened so far. And um, a house is at risk, a business is at risk, lots of things are at risk with tornadoes, and perhaps a wind turbine might be at risk as well. Wind farms tend to have several dozens, sometimes hundreds of wind turbines, so if you knock out one or two wind turbines, you're still left with a substantially functioning uh, wind farm, um, yeah. unlike a power plant where right. if it goes down, it goes down. Right. Um, if I could just ask you something about that. One, people have pointed out that with our grids, every now and then the city of New York goes black or something happened not terribly long ago, you know, but uh, there's always that danger. We are an urban population increasingly and then we depend on that grid absolutely and when something goes it it's disaster would we have this with wind well I think with wind you you still would have that that risk in that you you are reliant upon long-range transmission often to carry that wind generated ah, electricity okay. from let's say the farmlands of Kansas to Chicago or wherever it might be used um, one of the ways that solar technology which we'll talk yeah. about in a few minutes I think um, is very very helpful is that you can decentralize the production mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm, use mm -hmm. of electricity such that the risks of an entire network going down can be reduced. But when wind turbines are part of a broader uh, infrastructure for providing electricity, so there would be some of that vulnerability. Okay, one more question on location, location with, with, with this. Did, were, uh, in terms of conservation lands and, and uh, uh, Native uh, American lands and so on, which you brought up uh, in these cases, what was your judgment uh, when you went around the country talking to people? Um, there are some very real conservation concerns mm -hmm. that I think, again, the wind industry has gotten a lot smarter about addressing. Uh, bird mortality is a very real issue at some wind farms. Um, you need to site wind farms, hopefully, where there aren't endangered bird species, but there is some risk to bird life. Um, High-rise buildings kill birds, cars exactly, kill birds. Exactly, exactly. Um, Pollution, as, yes. Yeah, as, as one uh, scientist indicated to me, um, your average household cat um, kills over a billion birds you know, <laughs> per year. Uh, not, not, your, not one cat, not but, your the, cat, but you know, <laughs> the population of cats in America kill yeah, over yeah. Um, a billion birds right. per year in yeah. America. So yes, it's a hazard. Um, can one reduce that hazard? Yes. Um, Radar is used at some facilities to detect oncoming f incoming flocks of birds, for example. 
Um, bats are a concern as well, yeah. and what some wind farms have done is they shut down during periods of very low wind when they're not going to get much productivity anyway, and it's during those low wind periods that insects are flying, and therefore uh, bats are pursuing them I as see. food. I see. Um, and also during the sunset hours, um, insects tend to be out, and uh, they've tried to reduce wind turbine operations in those periods as well, where there are vulnerable bat species. So in West Virginia, for example, they've tried some of this, and with great um, positive effect in terms of vastly reducing the danger to bat life. Well, what you've suggested then is that with careful planning, with careful regulation, you can attend to most of the problems yes. and the benefit in the end. It's not a question we ever ask with gas and oil pumping, wrecking the environment and coal Precisely. communities and so on. So uh, it, it may move us in a humanitarian way uh, a, a, a good distance as, as well. One of, the, one of the ironies in Wyoming is that they have created a sage grouse core area protection program that has set aside a fifth of the state um, as a no-go area for wind farm development. Ironically, they allow gas drilling, yes, oil drilling, did. Coal mining in those same areas, yes. so there's a bit of Killed hypocrisy there. Few, uh, yes, that was a, a notorious case that a couple of environmental environmentalists have brought up that uh, conservation groups, large ones, well-known ones, made deals with oil companies. So you could, you know, fine, we'll give you some money, we're going to drill, yeah. nothing will go wrong. And of yeah. course it really affected the population yeah. they were trying to save. Yeah. But it, more of these questions will be raised, I suppose, in a different way. Well, that is really good about the about the wind, and evidently you anticipate that we'll develop this technology in a more effective way all the time. And I think we will develop it offshore at uh, last. Yes, and I, I meant to ask that. As a matter of fact, the what's the difference for or the advantage or disadvantage for yes. offshore and onshore? Well, what we're now looking at here in New England is um, building on the far side of Nantucket Sound as opposed to in Nantucket Sound. So we're talking about probably 10 or 15 miles uh, beyond the nearest landfall. Um, therefore, the issue of the visual uh, encroachment that was such a concern with the Cape Wind Project would not really be a concern at all. Um, and there are relatively few wildlife concerns. You have to make sure there aren't migratory bird species that are mm -hmm, passing mm -hmm. through the area, for example. Um, and during construction, there are concerns about marine mammals. Mm -hmm. um, what the Danes have found is that dolphins, for example, do flee from an area during construction, but they come back they immediately come after back, construction. Mm -hmm. So there are some issues, but offshore wind offers enormous potential. A study was done by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. It estimated that we could get about 10 times our total current power needs from land-based wind and another four times our current power needs from offshore wind resources. So these are prodigious resources that we really need to tap. And th I'm assuming that's relatively safe given high winds or uh, storms that they would build into the technology some protection in that way. But yes, that's exactly. very exciting that they could do this and benefit so hugely. Well, and we can now benefit from 20 years of experience in Denmark, in Germany, and in England um, with developing offshore wind technology. Uh, so these technologies are not new, they're tried and true, and we will be implementing them soon. Right, I think, here. right. It's incidentally a very nice technology for entrepreneurs, it seems to me, that it's very, you're doing something that's very beneficial, it's very exciting, there's a new development yes. every two weeks, it's yes. just great. Yes. Well, after that, you finished with the wind, and then you got on to solar, uh, and you admitted that you were not an advocate originally, and now you're a proud owner of solar panels and so on. What caused that change? Well, when I was finishing up the wind book, um, people ask me, so will your next book be about solar? And my, my flip response at the time was that if I wrote a book about solar, I'd have to call it Dim Sun. Because <laughs> I felt that the odds of solar developing were very slim. Uh, at that point, solar was very expensive. Yes, and since, inefficient. Yeah, and since that time, 
the price of solar has come down by about 50 percent. The technology has improved, the efficiencies are going up, and we have a thriving solar industry today. So I ate my words, and I, um, my wife and I decided to put solar on our home. We now get about 75 percent of our total power needs from the sun, and that includes the nightly charging of a plug-in electric vehicle. So it's made a very big difference yes. in our lives. Um, our daughters aren't thrilled with the fact that we don't operate our dryer anymore. Uh. Um, there are certain <laughs> economy measures we've taken, but um, it makes you much more aware of the power you're uh -huh. producing yeah. and the power you're consuming, and that's, I think, a very healthy thing. Right. So we started with our home, and then I began to look in various parts of the country at yeah. everything from warehouse roofs to football stadiums to uh, open desert uh, solar farms to um, urban brownfield yes. solar farms. And what's great about solar is there's a multiplicity of applications for solar, and we're just beginning to tap that potential. All right, so that's your idea that we're just beginning. It's, and it's gotten so much better so fast. Absolutely. And uh, there's plenty of sun, you know, for, for the time being. One of the things you brought up was the use of brownfields. This is not that familiar. Brownfields are not that familiar. We have plenty of them, uh, wrecked land. You, tell us about that, putting the solar installations on brownfields. What a great use, if you would. Yeah, there's a certain paradox here because we tend to turn our backs on our brownfields. Brownfields yeah. are everything from former mining areas to former factory sites to landfills that have been closed. Um, they're the kind of ugly corners of the nation that we'd rather forget about. But so contaminated that you can't really build on them, correct? Correct. That, okay. So they're a great opportunity to develop utility scale solar power. This has happened in Massachusetts on a number of landfill sites. Um, I have visited uh, a brownfield solar installation in Chicago in the heart of the south side of Chicago neighborhood called the West Pullman neighborhood. Um, this is a factory site for um, international harvester mm. machinery that fled the neighborhood um, back in the 80s and left a horribly contaminated site. Uh, Exelon came in uh, in 2008, cleaned up the site to a degree, um, and installed a solar uh, installation that now generates enough electricity for about 1,500 households and created local jobs. So it's a good example of what you can do with uh, a very degraded site. There are lots of other examples that I could give. Um, in California, there's a rocket fuel testing facility owned by Aerojet Rocketdyne. They've polluted the groundwater terribly, and they've recently installed a solar array that is now um, providing power for the pump and treat operations so that they can remediate the water supplies that they have so terribly contaminated. Um, so the opportunities abound. Um, here too, um, the government has done a study. The EPA has a department called um, Repowering America's Land, a program. And that program has looked at over 100,000 brownfield sites. And it estimates that if we were to tap the full solar potential of those sites, we could be getting about three times our mm. total power needs from the sun. So we're talking about a prodigious energy resource that if we just did that, we could be moving away from fossil fuels. But there are a lot of other things we can do with solar that are accessible and offer lots of advantages as well. Right, and you have there a difference of scales. That could be very local uh, yes. indeed, right, so that you have practically independence on your own. I remember when they started in Germany, people were selling their electricity back to the uh, energy plants for their excess uh, solar yes. energy. Um, uh, in terms of scale, what are we talking about? Like you have these huge solar fields and you yes. have very small things. Well, one of the great things about residential solar and solar on, let's say, a warehouse roof is that through a mechanism called net energy metering, um, we can sell our excess electricity back to our local utility. Mm -hmm. It's a great advantage to people who have invested in, in putting in solar facilities. Um, the sun is sometimes shining when you don't need um, the power. Sometimes you need the power when the sun isn't shining. Mm -hmm. And so it allows you to interact very flexibly with your local utility. Um, and that's certainly what we do here in Massachusetts. It's what 
many, many states are doing now in terms of offering that net energy metering opportunity. Um, and those uh, installations can be as small as the 23 panels we have on our residential mm -hmm. roof on up to um, the White Rose Food Storage Warehouse in New Jersey, which has covered an entire roof that extends for a quarter of a mile with solar panels and generates 90% of its power from the sun. So it's very scalable. And you have fields too, right? That don't yes. have, and so you could have huge fields of sol for solar panels and so on to yes. generate like Arizona and so on. Where so those are utility scale yeah. projects that are operating on a different model. So they're yeah. operating much as a conventional power plant okay. operates in that they generate a certain amount of power. It is sold on the wholesale power market. I see. And um, it is of a scale equivalent to a large power plant. So for example, one facility that I visited is called the California Valley Solar Ranch. It's built in San Luis Obispo County. It generates enough electricity for 100,000 California households. It's a giant facility. It's on about 1,400 acres of land. Um, and it raised some of the interesting issues about wildlife protection mm -hmm. regarding solar. Migration and stuff, uh, I see. So there were, for example, the San Joaquin kit fox and the giant kangaroo rat were considered vulnerable species that they wanted to make sure weren't harmed during the construction of that field. They collected those species, built what were called temporary condos for the, the condos. rats. Condos. <laughs> <laughs> and temporary dens for the, the kit fox. And then post-construction, they allowed these uh, creatures to re-inhabit the site. And they also made sure that between the solar fields, there were migratory corridors oh, yeah. for the antelope and elk. So they really went to great pains right. to minimize the environmental impact of their very substantial solar project. Right. And I want to emphasize that um, we tend to talk about clean energy and dirty energy. I like to talk about cleaner energy and dirtier energy in that you know, there is no such thing as totally clean energy. Um, there are impacts of renewable energy and we just have to manage them responsibly. Well, this is one of the interesting things that you brought out both in, in both books, is, is this planning, which suggests that we're moving in a rational direction at long last. I mean, we've had centuries of other kinds of planning, <laughs> more haphazard, without asking any questions about who we're intruding on. And uh, now this is changing the way we think it can be done. So this has been very interesting. Again, this is where you have brought up like Native American territory. Where I don't know if people are aware of how abused those communities have been with oil and gas. Could you give us a little background there and tell us about the solar, uh, how they responded to the possibility of solar? Well, again, it's a very new technology, so I think they're proceeding cautiously. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. also are cash poor, so they can't just jump at new investment right, opportunities. Right. But one um, community I visited, it's the Moapa Paiute tribe um, in southeastern Nevada. It's a very small tribe of less than 400 people, um, but they are very land rich. They have about 72,000 acres of land. Um, and on um, 2,000 acres, 2,000 2, times two, because they're two different solar farms, they've decided to build some photovoltaic um, solar capacity and they are selling that power actually into the Southern California grid. So they are providing electricity to greater Los Angeles, let's say. Um, and they too were very careful about how they protected local species. So in that case, um, the desert tortoise was the primary focus of concern. It's, an, it's a threatened species under the U.S. Um, Endangered Species Act. They translocated about 75 tortoises, fitted them with monitoring devices, and placed them in a conservation area that was, I think, 6,000 acres, a very large conservation area. And they found over the course of a long period of tracking them that only one of those translocated tortoises died and was killed as a result of a coyote attack, which could have happened mm -hmm, back where mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm, originally. Mm -hmm. So that was a success story, and they are now generating a very significant source of income from that solar facility. Again, they didn't have the capital to build it themselves, so they leased the land to a solar developer, and they're getting lease payments from that solar developer. Okay, but it's not the kind of environmental and community abuse that they had, I think, 
made them very uneasy, probably, or makes, continues to make them very, because they have been exploited so badly by the oil and, uh, well, well, industry. With this particular tribe, um, immediately adjacent to the tribal land is a very large coal plant uh -huh. that they have been fighting to get closed down, and it will close down. Good. There are other areas, for example, the Navajo are very heavily dependent upon employment by the coal industry. Some of the largest coal-fired power plants in the country uh, are on Navajo that, yeah. land. And so they are nervous about um, rocking the boat vis-a-vis -vis that very important source of income. It's a very major revenue stream for the tribal I economy, see. and it's also a major jobs provider, and it's also obviously been a major um, problem in terms of the Absolutely. health of Native Americans Absolutely. in that area. So they're caught between a rock and a hard place a little bit, but um, I suspect that they will begin to recognize the huge advantages of solar energy and recognize that it may be time to move away from some of their dependence upon right. coal. Uh, but again, it's a sort of a negotiation in a more honorable way, and a more rational way that they're doing this. So you're optimistic now about solar and presumably wind, and then, um, in terms of the country as a whole, how do you read our attitude, why we've been so slow, slower than any developed nation, and the president has been trying to move us along and they're still getting resistance. What's your take now? How are we going to go forward? Well, I think one of the encouraging things about both solar and wind is that in states that aren't ideologically aligned with uh, the president's agenda vis-a-vis -vis climate change, we're seeing solar and wind take off. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Texas, 10% of that state's power now comes from wind. And Texas is the largest electricity consumer in the country. It's not the I largest, know that. Uh -huh. it's not, it doesn't have the largest population, right, but it's the but biggest consumer of power. So 10% of that state's power is very considerable. Kansas is a very conservative state. It gets 21% of its power today from wind. Um, if you, Wyoming is thinking of developing solar, uh, sorry, wind, there are some very large parcels of land, ranch land that they may well develop as wind yeah, farms right. to bring wind into uh, Cal Southern California, actually that right. market. And so it kind of defies political norms. Yes, these are very red states, yes. yes. Um, and there are some good things happening at the state level. One of the great catalysts uh, to both solar and wind is um, the renewable portfolio standard, which is a minimum amount of electricity that a state determines must come from qualifying renewable sources. Um, California, not surprisingly, is in the lead in this regard. Um, it requires that by 2030, 50% of that state's power must come from renewable resources. Uh, and that does not include large-scale hydro. So we're talking about a fundamental transformation yes, in really their energy Yes, really renewable, uh, yeah. So we've been stymied at the national level, unfortunately. Yes. Um, the president, I think, um, with his clean power plan was very much on the right track, and that has been slowed down. But I think the economics are, are moving significantly away from coal in any case, and I think we will see a lot of those plants shut down. We're already seeing a lot of them shut down. In the agreement pro uh, proposal, I suppose, uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, North, North America, will try, I think it is 2030, it's a, the, really it's a decade away or something or other, uh, they're going going to have a large percent of this, but they are including among renewable nuclear energy and hydropower, uh, both of which have lots of problems. Um, do you think that might change down the line that this, that there, as I mean that as solar and wind become much more efficient uh, all the time and much easier to deploy, do you think maybe they'll change and get rid of the nu nuclear temptation and hydropower? Yeah, uh, we'll deal with them one at a time. Um, nuclear, to me, is a very, very precarious technology mm -hmm. for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which is that we live in politically incredibly tumultuous times, and for the United States to be perpetuating that technology and then at the same time telling 
other nations that they can't do so, I think, smacks of hypocrisy and um, invites abuse of a very, very vulnerable technology. We're producing weapons grade materials at mm -hmm. these facilities that pose a very real threat to the world. I'd um, like to tell people that I think you wrote a letter to the editor or an op-ed something for the New York Times yes. and I, that's on this event page, I believe, but it was this warning exactly. Excuse me. Yeah, no. Um, I think nuclear is a kind of temptation. We think of it just as we did in the 50s as a kind of panacea. Mm. If, well, if only we could develop the next generation of nuclear plants, then we can move forward and we don't have to bother with all this solar and all this wind. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, a, it's an illusion and I think it's a very dangerous illusion. And from a purely economic standpoint right now, wind and solar are significantly cheaper than building mm -hmm. a new nuclear power well, plant. Well, you don't have stuff to bury. You don't have very dangerous uh, waste to also true, but even if you set that aside, yeah. the upfront costs of building one of these plants um, are huge. And um, the life, if you look again over the life cycle of a nuclear power plant, we're talking about um, an estimated cost that's about twice the cost yes. of wind or solar. So it even those who sense, ideologically yeah. say we should develop nuclear should take a hard look at the economics before they move in that direction. Right, so that's uh, pretty negative. And then hydropower, which still people are still out there talking about. It. Although that, uh, I don't know if, uh, if it's well known, that has a, an environmental impact that is just terrible, yes. Um, there are, there are small-scale hydro opportunities that are very, very different than mm -hmm. building a massive dam that floods an entire ecosystem. And so I think we have to kind of bifurcate mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. our analysis mm -hmm. of, of hydro. Um, there is the temptation right now to import large quantities of Canadian hydro, Quebec hydro, into New England so that we can meet our um, climate uh, change obligations here in Massachusetts, for example. And it's a very dicey dialogue that is going right, going on right now in the Massachusetts uh, Senate. I see. Well, after all of this, I see that we're getting low on time here. But in the future, you think that the renewables are we're, we're getting there, definitely getting there. We might catch up with other developed nations. <laughs> well, I should say actually that the United States, um, in terms of solar technology, right now. Um, is second only to Germany, and it will very likely surpass Germany That's this amazing, year. That's amazing, because they were out in front. Absolutely, for decades. And, well, for, yeah, since the late 1990s. <laughs> um, and in terms of wind technology, we are also um, among the world leaders. Um, China has more installed wind capacity, but we actually produce more wind power because we I have see. been much more um, systematic in making sure that if we build a wind farm, it can be hooked up to the grid and that that I power see. will actually be used. So I would say we've really moved from being laggards to being leaders in pushing renewable energy forward. Um, and one more thing, because now we're, I'm sorry to say we're out of time and there was uh, were several things more to ask, uh, uh, ask you, what's next? Are you planning another book? <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about various other books, but nothing is ripe at the moment, so ah, I, I, can't, okay. I can't share. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we were hoping, you know, a book, a movie, or something or other. I would like to end, though, right, uh, telling uh, viewers that these are very readable accounts. They're different in the sense that you're talking to a great number of people here and abroad, and so you get pros and cons. You uh, and. Uh, it's interesting to hear these voices. It's a different approach to doing uh, this kind of a project. And we very much appreciate your sharing it with us. I hope you'll keep us posted when you start the next project, by all means. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Best of luck. Thank you.